Hello and welcome to Shubhranjan IAS. I am Aman Soni and I will be discussing with you the Indian economy questions from UPSC Civil Services Mains Exam of 2021. So we are here to do the analysis of Indian economy from UPSC Mains 2021. Like if you see this year's exam, we got Indian economy questions in GS1 as well as in GS3. In GS1, before coming to GS3, which is our main part, before coming to GS3, I will be telling you about GS1. So, in GS1, we got two questions on Indian economy. One was regarding gigs economy. Other question was regarding cryptocurrency. These two questions, they have been dealt in a separate discussion. You can like go through them on, on YouTube at Shubhranjan IS channel only. What I'll be discussing with you is, I'll be discussing the questions from GS3. Okay, so in GS3, we got total 9 questions. There are 5 questions of 10 marks each, total 50 marks. And then there were 4 more questions, which were of 15 marks each and total 60 marks. So that overall, we got 110 marks of Indian economy out of 250. Alright, now let's start the discussion. All right. Look, the first question is explain the difference between computing methodology of India's GDP before the year 2015 and after the year 2015. If you see the trend of UPSC, this year everything has changed. This year, even in prelims, most of the questions were from core concepts, hardly anything from current affairs. Even in the main questions of GS3 of Indian economy, there is hardly anything from current affairs. Most of the things are from core concepts. So this question, it, it, it is like a symbol that it, there is a pattern change in UPSC. So the question is that what is the difference between computing methodology of India's GDP before 2015 and after the year 2015? 10 marks, 150 words. Look, remember. In economy section, if we have to give introduction, we'll always start with either a definition or we can give a fact. This is a rule for Indian economy. We'll either give a definition or we'll give a fact. So in this question, what we can do is if we have to go for definition, then we'll say will give the definition of Indian GDP, will give the definition of GDP, will say that GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced by the factors of production in a period of one year in the domestic boundary of a country. That's one thing. If we have to go by fact, then you can mention that Indian economy, that India's GDP is of around 200 lakh crore rupees. And GDP is calculated by NSO. That's it. That's what that you can mention. Or you can also tell that in the year 2002, in the year 2020, India witnessed a technical recession because of lockdown and our GDP fell. So you can give any of these two any of these two introductions. You can give a definition or you can give the fact also. And then you will mention one more sentence that in the year 2008. UN, World Bank and IMF. All these three organizations together, they recommended SNA method, system of national accounts. They recommended SNA method for GDP calculation and India adopted that method in the year 2015. And then we will say, then we will come to the body that following changes have taken place in the computing methodology since 2015 and we will say first part is that the base year it changed from 
2000 4 5 2 11 12 this is the first change second we will tell that after computing now after computing before 2015 our gdp was real gdp fc but now our gdp has become real gdp mp then third thing we will say is that the new method is statistically more robust here we are using data from mca 21 we are using data from mca 1 mca 21 database we are using the data from iip also then we will see earlier method it measured only the actual production actual production of manufacturing of of services sector all these things but now we are we have made it more robust it is more comprehensive where we are getting data from financial institutions also all right so as it is like very short number of words for 50 words we'll just write only these four points that that's the difference between uh, computing methodology be, between before 2015 and after 2015 and then we'll come to the conclusion in conclusion we have read always know that conclusion should always be positive in nature conclusion should always be way forward so in conclusion we'll write that indian indian government is focusing not only on economic growth it is also focusing on making the whole growth process more inclusive by bringing programs like mudra yojana by jandhan yojana by pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana so and like by skill india mission by swachh, by swachh bharat mission so by bringing all these schemes government is focusing on inclusive growth and not just economic growth all right that is the discussion of question number 1 let's move to second question second question is also a very very straight forward question the question is from the chapter fiscal policy the question is distinguish between capital budget distinguish between capital budget and revenue budget explain the components of both these budgets again very very straight forward question an introduction will give the definition of budget we'll say budget is a annual financial statement telling about income and expenditure of the government just a straight forward to the point to the point statement and then we'll have to tell capital budget and revenue budget we'll say capital budget it consists of we'll come to the body capital budget it consists of capital expenditure and capital receipts so we'll say what is capital expenditure and what is capital expenditure we'll say capital expenditure it either creates assets or it reduces the liabilities and what are capital receipts capital receipts are those receipts which either create liabilities which either create liabilities or which reduce the assets then we will say that capital expenditure it consists of the following capital expenditure consists of what expenditure on infrastructure creation loans given loans returned all right and then we will say capital receipts there are of two types debt creating capital receipts and non debt creating capital receipts debt creating capital receipts are loans taken and non debt creating capital receipts are what it is first is loans recovered and disinvestment proceeds okay so we have we have given the definition of capital expenditure capital receipts and side by side we have also told the components of capital expenditure and capital receipts and then we'll tell about revenue expense we'll see revenue budget revenue budget it consists of 
revenue expenditure and revenue receipts we'll say what is what is revenue expenditure which which neither creates assets neither creates assets nor reduces liabilities and what is revenue receipts which neither which neither creates liabilities nor nor reduces assets then we'll say that revenue expenditure it consists of the following revenue expenditure consists of what it consists of maintenance of expenditure and maintenance of infrastructure creation then interest paid on loans taken grants given to other countries and states then what else on revenue law and order expenditure subsidies expenditure on welfare schemes etc all right and then we will have to tell about revenue receipts which i am mentioning over here that it can following following consists of revenue receipt that revenue receipts consists of two one is tax revenue receipts and other is non tax revenue receipts tax revenue receipts it consists of direct tax revenue receipts indirect tax revenue receipts and non tax revenue receipts it consists of what it consists of interest earned on loans given grants received uh, service income all these things they come under revenue receipts and then in conclusion we will say that currently india's revenue expenditure is eight times india uh, eight times india's revenue expenditure sorry india's revenue expenditure is eight times our capital expenditure if india has to become a developed country if india has to uh, reduce the number of poor people then it needs to increase its capital expenditure which should be a multiple of revenue expenditure not the opposite all right that completes the discussion of question number 2 let's move to third question third question is from land reforms look land reforms and food processing industries these are two topics in agriculture from which we will surely get a question means either we will get a question from land reforms or we will get a question from from food processing industries if we see last 3 4 years trend we have been getting a question from food processing industry every year but there's no question from land reform this year there was a question from land reforms hence no question from food processing industry and whenever the question comes from land reforms or it comes from food processing industry almost every time the question they are direct okay so this question is also very very direct question the question is that how did land reforms in some parts of the country help to improve the socio economic conditions of small and marginal farmers an introduction will give the definition of land reforms that land reforms were basically redistribution of land from rich farmers to the poor farmers and land reforms it consisted of various types of reforms like zamindari abolition tenancy reforms land selling and cooperative movement that will be the introduction then we have to tell that how did land reforms in some part of the country right we'll address this some part of the country and we'll say that land reforms they were carried out by the state governments therefore they varied in their effectiveness from state to state so depending upon how a state carried out the land reform the certain the certain states which carried out land reforms in those states the situation of small and marginal farmers improved and the states which did not carry land reforms in the spirit in those states the situation did not improve and then we will tell that how did it help the socio economic conditions of small and marginal farmers we have to tell about socio as well as economic conditions so we'll say it improved the socio economic conditions in the following ways first is that land reforms gave the land to the tiller so as the land was given to the tiller it means the one who was cultivating the land he was made the owner therefore the tiller now he didn't have to pay any rent 
and his exploitation also stopped then zamindari was abolished but tenancy was reformed so because of tenancy reforms what happened is that the situation of tenants improved the tenants they got security of tenure at the same time the rent was brought down to a fair and just level so economically they were helped moreover as rent was not to be first of all the tiller were made the owner second whoever was tilling if there was a tenant if the, as the rent was brought down obviously it, it increased the savings of small and marginal farmers as the savings increased the investment it also increased in agriculture as savings increased it reduced poverty as savings increased as it reduced poverty now the now the poor people of of the villages they had more money to spend on education and health hence their social condition also improved then as investment increased therefore investment in agriculture increased agriculture production also increased as agriculture production increased it brought food security to most of the people in rural areas especially small and marginal farmers then land reforms it made the whole rural society more egalitarian more equality came in rural society the societal status of small and marginal farmers improved then in conclusion will write that institutional land reforms they actually paved way for more technological land reforms like green revolution which further increased agriculture production and which further improved the situation of small and marginal farmers in the country that completes discussion of third question uh, let's move to next question next question is again from agriculture chapter question is like how and what extent to what extent would micro irrigation help in solving india's water crisis so basically we have to tell that high, how can micro irrigation it can help india in overcoming its water crisis in introduction we will give the definition of micro irrigation so we will say micro irrigation is the slow application of water directly to the roots of the plants through drips or by using jet sprays of sprinklers okay then we will tell that micro irrigation can help in solving india's water crisis in the following ways first we'll say micro irrigation is more water efficient efficiency of micro irrigation is around 90 percent while efficiency of flood irrigation is around just 35 to 40 percent then we'll say because of micro irrigation the it it reduces the vulnerability to dependence on monsoon because of micro irrigation we can focus on dry land farming micro irrigation would reduce the demand of water which would also help in reducing the number of river disputes moreover it would also reduce the vulnerability towards drought we'll say that this is how it is it will be helping in solving india's water crisis because less amount of water will be reduced at the same time at the same time uh, micro irrigation it will be helping in increase in yield of crop because water is provided directly to the root of the crop then it also helps in increasing 
or it also encourages efficient use of fertilizers because of fertigation then it will also reduce the problem of weeds because water is provided directly to the roots and then in conclusion we will write that government of india is focusing ha huh, one more thing one more thing it will also help in crop diversification and then in conclusion we will write that because of micro government of india is promoting micro irrigation by bringing schemes like uh, pradhan mantri krishi sinchai yojana all right that completes discussion of this question now let's discuss, discuss next question which is from money laundering so question is like discuss discuss how emerging technologies and globalization contribute to money laundering elaborate measures to tackle the problem of money laundering both at national and international level so we have to tell that how emerging technologies and globalization emerging technology leading to money laundering and how is globalization leading to money laundering and what is being done at national and international level to counter the menace of money laundering in introduction we will give the definition of money laundering we will say money laundering is the process by which the money which is earned from illegal means is made to appear to be to have been earned from legal means that is called money laundering and then we will say how are emerging technologies leading we will say in emerging technologies new technologies like peer to peer lending new online financial institutions they are leading to money laundering then the upcoming of more number of proxy servers and anonymous softwares it also helps then online gaming and gambling websites gaming and gambling then dark web then latest one cryptocurrencies bitcoin they also help in money laundering then how is globalization happening because in because of globalization what has happened is that at once the money has entered international financial system it becomes very difficult to track it then at international level there have been concepts of treaty shopping beps transfer pricing hawala all of them tax havens shell companies all these they lead to money laundering then in, at globalization level the whole amount is broken the a big amount is broken down into small small amounts and trans multiple transactions are done due to which it becomes very very difficult to track to, to keep a trail of the all money transactions so that is how globalization is also uh, leading to money laundering okay and then what is being done at national at national at international level at national level we have uh, we have prevention of money laundering act 2002 that is being done india is also signatory of dta with many countries through which it is countering the the money laundering problem then in india cbi it always interacts with interpol on how to counter the money laundering issues at international level we have financial action transaction force fatf was set up in 1989 then european parliament 
it also regularly directs its countries that they have to find fight money laundering and then in conclusion we will write that recently the g7 countries they have agreed to a global minimum tax rate system so that the so that the problem of shell companies and money laundering is is nipped in the bud all right that completes the discussion of this question let's move to next question the next question is from current affairs the question is about the recovery process which india is witnessing so the question is like do you agree that indian economy has recently experienced v shape recovery give reasons in support of your answer in this question we don't have to just tell that india may be facing a v shape recovery or may be facing another type of recovery whatever we stand we take we just need to substantiate it we need to do a you know a reasoned analysis that what what what's actually happening so in introduction in introduction we'll give the definition of recovery and v shape recovery so we'll say what is recovery when the gdp falls and then when it goes back to its original position it is called recovery or say economic recovery and when the economy takes a very very small when the economy takes a very short span of time to get back to the original level that is called v shape recovery and then we would say that you know economic survey of 21 and budget of 21 both of them they were making a case that india is is making uh, india will be getting a v shape recovery and why were they saying that india is getting a v shape recovery because first of all india in the indian government expenditure increased drastically government expenditure increased drastically through atmanirbhar bharat package they had recommended they had like suggested that india may, may be witnessing a v shape recovery because government expenditure had increased india's import and export has had increased india's oil exports had increased so these were the reasons and moreover in quarter 3 india witnessed a growth rate of 4% in quarter 1 quarter 2 india's gdp fell but in quarter 4 india's gdp increased so it was expected that it will get a v shape recovery and then when in quarter 1 21 22 when we got a growth rate of 20% we had a quite we, we were quite hopeful that we will surely get a v shape recovery but then we would we did not take into consideration the second wave so then we will say that because of second wave everything fell away and now we are expecting instead of v shape recovery we are expecting a k shape recovery why k shape recovery first is like certain sectors like logistics hospitality services sector they have been hit they have been severely hit and they have reached the gva level of 2017-18 then we'll say that you know that the effect of covid is not uniform spatially and temporally the effect is different in different areas in northern in northern states the effect is more in eastern states the effect is less then then we'll say because of 4g and because of technology many online technologies have also mushroomed up so certain sectors are going up certain sectors are going down so we are expecting a k shape recovery and then in conclusion we'll write that now because of onset of third wave and because of omicron variant we may not even get a k shape recovery what we are witnessing a w shape recovery okay that completes the discussion of this question let's move to next question next question is from infrastructure chapter question is like investment in infrastructure is essential for more rapid and inclusive economic growth discuss in the light of india's experience in introduction we will write that inadequate or will rather rather will change the infrastructure will change the introduction will say that it's that it is said in us that it's not that us is good 
therefore us roads are good but it is the opposite that us roads are good therefore us is good so that actually it summarizes the importance of infrastructure that how if infrastructure is good then only the country will appear to be good but then only the country will progress then we'll say that how investment in infrastructure is required for more rapid and inclusive economic growth we'll have to say rapid first we'll say that if there is so if we say that infrastructure we'll say infrastructure is of two types hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure hard infrastructure it includes roads railways ports airports soft infrastructure it consists of hospitals schools government policies regulations and we need as energy of hard and soft soft infrastructure then only the economy will progress then we'll say that how infrastructure leads to more rapid and inclusive economic growth because first is that public investment in infrastructure it attracts more private investment in infrastructure when i say public investment in infrastructure it means construction of more ports airports roads railways so when government spends money on public infrastructure then it creates more employment opportunities all right it creates more employment opportunities then because of that public infrastructure more companies more factories they come up which further create more employment opportunities and because of these employment opportunities we get inclusive growth moreover because of this employment growth there is increase in demand and further increase in production that is how infrastructure is contributing then infrastructure it has huge forward and backward linkages with agriculture industry and services then because of infrastructure there will be development of schools and hospitals which will help in contributing to human capital which will also help in inclusive growth then because of infrastructure creation there will be benefit to the farmers also it will be helpful in doubling farmers income okay then then we'll say challenges is that though most of the poor in india they stay in rural areas but the government's focus on infrastructure creation it happens in cities it happens in industrial areas so if we have to go for inclusive growth government should focus more on more infrastructure creation in rural areas and that infrastructure which is pertaining to agriculture sector and then in conclusion we'll write that government has launched various programs for for infrastructure development like gati launch of various expressways etc to increase the infrastructure development in india all right that completes discussion of this question let let's now move to next question question number 13 which is again from say agriculture chapter or say i would say it is from human resource development ch development chapter so question is what are the salient features of national food security act how has the food security bill helped in eliminating hunger and malnutrition in india so we'll start with the introduction like we will tell national food security act we'll say national food security act 2013 it was brought as a revamped version of tpds to increase the food security in india okay and then we'll say following are the major features first is that national food security act it would be covering 75% of rural population and 50% of urban population in short it will be covering 67% of indian population second it would be providing food grains at 5 kg per person per month and food grains will be provided at rupees 3 rupees 2 rupees 1 rupees per kg for rice wheat and coarse cereals then pregnant women and lactating mothers they would be given they would be given a benefit of rupees 6000 rupees per month then 
द आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ बेनिफिशरीज विल बी बाय द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट देन वुमेन ऑफ द हाउस विल बी कंसिडर्ड द हेड ऑफ द हाउस होल्ड फॉर दिस पर्पज देन प्रेगनेंट वुमेन लेक्टेटिंग मदर्स एंड चिल्ड्रन दे विल बी गिवन मील्स अंडर आई सी डी एस and then we'll say that how has food security bill helped in eliminating hunger first is we'd say because of national food security act the number of the incidence of stunting it has reduced in india stunting which was 48% in 2012 has come to now 32% then because of food security the you know the the mid day meal scheme the students enrolled in mid day meal scheme it has increased to 116 million then the undernourished people in india has also have also reduced undernourished people they have also reduced in india but then we would say that yes national food security act it has brought food security but certain certain challenges they still remain like in global hunger index we are still ranked 101 out of 116 actually this is actually the source of this question that why in spite of national food security act we are still at 101 in global hunger index then we'll say the number of women who are anemic it has increased malnutrition people or the mal the incidence of malnutrition hasn't reduced number of obese people it is actually increasing in india and then in conclusion we will write that because of national food security act as we have got as we are going towards food security now we should achieve nutritional security and we should provide more amount of millets coarse cereals and pulses in national food security through national food security act so that overall the incidence of hunger and incidence of malnutrition are reduced all right that completes the session of this question let's now move to the discussion of 14th question the question is again it's from chapter agriculture what are the yeah what are the present challenges before crop diversification so this we have to tell and what are the challenges before crop diversification second is how do emerging technologies provide an opportunity for crop diversification in introduction we'll give the definition of crop diversification that is when we cultivate more number of crops in a particular area to increase the production of different crops it is called crop diversification that is we are diversifying the crops which we are cultivating so that's the introduction definition of crop diversification and then we'll say what are the challenges before coming to challenge so we'll say following are the challenges before crop diversification that is we are we have we are getting towards we are towards monoculture and we are not going towards crop diversification because of the following reasons first is because of higher msp given to cereals second is open procurement for wheat and rice high yield for cereals like wheat and wheat and rice then food security of even the poor farmers like in india's case 90% of farmers are marginal and small farmers if we have to take care of they are food security they need to cultivate wheat and rice only so food security is also another challenge another reason why we are cultivating why, why we are going towards monoculture and why we are reluctant to go towards crop diversification then fragmentation of land holdings because of fragmentation of land holding we cannot go for those crops which are which are produced in which are produced in like large areas which are produced in big big farms so fragmentation of land holding inadequate presence of machinery is also another reason why there is no crop diversification then the weak 
द वीक पोजिशन ऑफ फूड प्रोसेसिंग इंडस्ट्री बिकॉज इफ आई एम कल्टिवेटिंग न्यू क्रॉप आई नीड अ मार्केट फॉर दैट एंड इफ दर इज नो मार्केट फॉर दैट आई वुड गो फॉर द सेफ क्रॉप ऑफ वीट एंड राइस आई वुड कंटिन्यू फॉर मोनोकल्चर आई वुड नॉट गो फॉर क्रॉप डाइवर्सिफिकेशन एंड देन वी वुड से दैट इन स्पाइट ऑफ दिस चैलेंजेस crop diversification it comes out with various positives first is because of crop diversification the fertility of the soil would increase then because of crop diversification the crops will become less prone to pest and disease attack then it would also provide a variety to the customers at the same time it will also provide more sources of nutrition to the customers will be if we are producing more number of millets more number of pulses will be able to sell them more under national food security act through pda shops and then we will tell that how can emerging technologies help in crop diversification first we will say is that because of technology we can produce drought resistant varieties then technologies they enable micro irrigation which will help us in dry land farming then using information technology the farmers can directly connect with the customers the farmers they can find more number of markets then using technology there will be more financial inclusion of farmers and then because of emerging technologies we can go towards new type of farmings like aquaponics and urban farming and there in conclusion we can write that emerging technologies they should be made a integral part of double, of doubling farmers income because now when we cannot increase the production by increasing area the only way to increase the production is by using better technologies that completes discussion of uh, this question also if you see overall trend again the trend is like most of the questions they have come from agriculture chapter the questions are conceptual in nature we need a proper clarity of the question what we have to write and then as per the fragmentation of the question we need to answer each and every part all right that completes the discussion thank you